G'day everyone, it's James Davis from the Paxate Academy again, and this time I've got Michael Silva from Emily AI. How are you doing, Michael? I'm doing really good, James. Thanks for having me. Well, I noticed there's a bit of an accent. Where are you based in this wide world of ours? My accent is a New York City accent. I actually grew up here, and uh, we have our office in the mid in middle of uh, Midtown Manhattan, so we're uh, born and raised in New York. That's awesome. So you're, you're from a place that has nearly more population than where we're located, so... I'm, I'm excited to have you and it's going to be a very exciting conversation, I think, because obviously AI is an important topic. It's sort of what dare, dare I say it, it's the you know, current buzzword that's going around and been around this space for quite a, quite a while. And I want to ask you a simple question to start with is what actually is AI? Yeah, it's a good question. So a lot of people have different understandings of what AI is, uh, personal opinion, AI is any technology that's using any type of generative technology, uh, any type of database vectoring on the back end to try to extract out information in a way that a human would uh, simulate it, right, a as a machine. Uh, but there's different ways that artificial intelligence can be used. Um, there's artificial superintelligence. I mean, there's this concept of like the swarm mentality of everyone contributing to one common knowledge base. So, you know, AI is really kind of a loose term. And I, and I think that the lack of regulation uh, in even the way you call it and what it is, is a huge problem. Like a lot of people just don't understand what AI is. And I think that's because it can mean a lot of things depending on your background. Now I'm finding the same thing. It's um, that sort of vagueness. It's, it's giving me flashbacks to when the cloud came out. The cloud just meant anything really. Um, and it, it made it very difficult for a small business technologists to have, have proper conversations with their clients. And with the changes of the threat landscape, cybersecurity, the different technologies, things have gotten a little more complicated. So when we are starting with AI, what should we really be thinking about? And where's our sort of starting point um, as a small business technologist? Yeah. Wow. This is such a great question. Thanks, James. Um, so where do we start with AI? Well, I think that it depends on what you're trying to do with it, uh, I think is really the, the ultimate goal because at the end of the day, I feel like a lot of people forget that AI is just software, right? It's really fancy software. Um, it's automation. And uh, in a certain regard, it is very different in its new capabilities. But, you know, from the lens of a software solution, a software architect and a systems designer, it's actually kind of old, right? If you look back at like machine learning and, you know, the history of artificial intelligence and what it means and things like knowledge graphs and stuff, I mean, th these concepts go back, like in some cases, hundreds of years. So, you know, it really depends on what your view of this is. Um, now, if you're looking at this from a, how do I talk to C-suite leadership? And, you know, let's say that you are an AI, uh, you know, advocate or you're an integrator or, you know, an, let's say you're a managed service provider, head of IT, and you're trying to talk to leadership about, you know, what are we doing with this, right? Like I'm reading about this in the news. What does this mean, right? Or, hey, I, I, I saw, I got this cool email and it says AI is going to revolutionize my life. Like, awesome. Like, what does this actually mean? So... Um, what, what we typically do is we typically ask a, cu a couple of common uh, conversation starting questions to leaders, uh, C-suite leaders, just to get the juices flowing, right? Because best conversations are one where you're, you're mostly listening, at least um, you know, when you're trying to advise someone, as ironic as that may sound. So what we typically start with are questions like, you know, how do you expect to benefit from artificial intelligence initiatives, right? Or you know, do you feel like you can trust AI? Or, you know, what do you think AI should be able to do is one of my favorite questions, you know, because you get into these boardrooms and you say to people, you know, hey, like, we're really excited about AI. And they're like, oh, us too. And then they go off on this rant of things that like AI isn't capable of, you know, or maybe it might be capable of, but it's like completely orthogonal to the use case of the business actually needs, you know, and then you've got the whole separate problem of adoption. And then when you're developing it, you know, you have to think about, is this what my customers actually want? Right. Like when we were developing uh, Emily AI in the beginning, you know, the initial use case was for us to open up a help desk ticket. Right. But then as we started to deploy it, you know, we had somebody say, hey, could you like define this acronym for me? This is like really important. They had like 400 acronyms. It's like the least sexy use case you could possibly think of for artificial intelligence is what does this acronym mean? What does this dictionary definition mean? But, you know, when you're a new hire, these are like really important questions. But, you know, when it comes to AI, how is that person going to ask that question? Is the search engine, that software, going to understand what that question is and be able to return back the right answer? And where does your data come from, right? I think this is also really important. 
And these are, you know, part of things you have to think about when you're designing an artificial intelligence uh, solution from scratch or when you're just having that AI conversation with executives. It's really interesting. And I think a lot of, um, say, typical MSPs and system integrators wouldn't be thinking about it this way. They'd be going straight to, um, straight to the tech, straight to assuming that it will um, automate and solve a lot of the world's problems without understanding that sort of strategic side of how it fits into the business. And then you're starting to mention adoption, but what you sort of wrapped up there with uh, me that triggered me is that that data, um, most organizations data isn't that great. So how should we be viewing this in terms of governance and structure and, um, I guess usability of the data for this kind of technology? Well, these are three excellent questions. Um, so I think that the first thing you need to think about, again, I'm a big proponent from a business standpoint of what are you, what are you using it for? What do you want it to do, right? Because you have to kind of work backward from the business use case. I'm an engineer at heart, right? I love to build things. I love to design complex machines. And, you know, the other side of me is the business side says, how much can you remove and still keep things moving smoothly? And is it actually necessary? And what does it do? The, you know, does it produce real value? So, you know, when you talk about the, the data going in and, and governance and things like that, I think this is one of the biggest problems with the understanding of artificial intelligence as it stands today. Right? If you look at big public models like ChatGPT and others, um, they use large language models. And you know, I like to inform people, because I, I have this conversation all the time, I say when, when you're working with a system that's not secure, like ChatGPT, you're sending information in and you're getting back this amazing, accurate, cool you know, information uh, where it appears to be accurate, right? That's the other thing. The AI just gives you what a great looking answer should look like, not necessarily what the correct answer is. Separate problem for later. Um, but what you're getting back is really, you know, an answer that looks great. And, you know, when you put data into these large learning model systems, unless it's designed with security and privacy in mind from the ground up, you are part of the large. It, that's just what it boils down to, right? The large learning model, your thoughts are part of large. And the news is strewn with examples of this. So you can go on any major news uh, publication today and you can see that, oh, you know, the training data was exposed to this algorithm and, oh, we got it to do this weird thing that we didn't expect. And, you know, well, this data actually leaked out. I mean, so, well, how is this stuff even getting there in the first place? Right? It, you know, it's like my father used to tell me, if you don't want someone to read something, don't write it down. It's like, <laughs> it's so fundamental. But, you know, what... You know, but what a lot of people are doing is they're writing everything down and they're giving it away. And, you know, we do have governance frameworks, right? Like I, I wrote a nice article about this earlier, but I, ISO 42001 is a great structure for it. And, you know, I think everybody would love to say that they adhere to specific ISO standards and that they're all standards based. If you're security, you've got every CIS control in the book, you know, and it's all fully implemented and you run a tight jet. I mean, look, the reality is it's a guideline, right? That's really what we're dealing with today. So the questions that I have are really like, what are you, what are you, where's your data going? Where is it coming from, right? So if you look at where the data is coming from, that's really important, right? Because you're making business decisions. You're saying, this is an artificial intelligence. This is something that's going to teach me something. Okay, well, what does it know, right? Because if you're pulling this information from a data set that is wrong, it's garbage in, garbage out. As simple as that. Right. So you're going to be misinformed and there's serious problems about being misinformed. And I have a whole white paper that we wrote up about this. Like what goes wrong as a leader, as a CEO, when you give incorrect information to your team, right? When you send them down the wrong path. And, and also how do you recover from that? Like, you know, the political capital that you lose when you tell your team, hey, you know, I knew this was the case, but you didn't. You guessed and you used the wrong AI to give you that answer. I mean, it's just creates this like whirlwind of problems and like, you, you really can't explain your way out of it, right? It's, it's, it's kind of like copying someone else's homework at that point. You're like, you just didn't do the work yourself. That's what it comes down to, right? So that's the first part is that you got to make sure the data is coming from an accurate place. And then also like, how do you present it back out, right? And I think that that's something that we're seeing now today is a lot of the presentation end of things. We're seeing people take a unicorn and make it change colors 10 times, make a cat infinitely harder working, right? I produced a really funny video on this, just make the cat work harder, right? It's cool. You can turn different colors and you can send a man to space. What happens if he's even further in outer space? It's awesome, dude. But the reality is like, what are you really using it for? <laughs> okay, like, what, you know, where's your data coming from? Which means that it has to be coming from a private data source. And then you go to standards and you say about on the compliance end of things, when somebody comes to you with that super uncomfortable question, right? What have you done with my PII? You gotta be able to answer that. You gotta be able to say, oh, you know what? I took your data. And I know that you told me that you could trust me with it because we have multi-factor 
And I know that you told me that, you know, I, I know that we told you that, you know, we could keep it secure and private, but my marketing team wasn't quite sure how to respond to that last compliance request. So we put it through this public AI system. Sorry. <laughs> and now there you go. Now the data's out there. So, you know, it, it's, it's one of these like unspoken problems where everybody's looking at the result. Nobody's really looking at what's going on under the hood. And, and a few places are getting it. A few places are really getting it. If you look closely, like, you know, GDPR, it's like everything else compliance related. Starts off in Europe, makes its way to California, comes to New York, suddenly becomes a U.S. standard. But not without a lot of pain first. So, yeah, that, that would be my advice is just, you know, look at this and say, where's your data coming from? A, you know, how are you getting it back out again? And then, you know, are you really set up for success when it comes to structured AI implementation for compliance in the future? As you're saying that, I, I went straight back. I just had flashbacks to high school when my maths teacher used to um, enforce us to le really learn all the formulas properly and understand the math behind it. Um, and she would always say, um, always respond to the, uh, the other students when they'd go, oh, we've got a calculator. Why do we need to know this? She'd always whip out this calculator and input some data and go, see, see this result? You would assume this is right. But actually, when I write it up on the up on the board here, it's wrong. So if you don't yeah. sort of understand those components, you're going to be in a, quite a bit of trouble from what you're saying. You're 100% right. And look, I mean, if you look at like the evolution of these tools, right, a lot of people are scared of AI. They're really afraid. They're like, oh my God, I'm going to lose my job to AI. Well, guess what? Spoiler alert. You're not going to lose your job to AI. I mean, maybe some people will. The majority of you probably safe, but you know who you will lose your job to? You're going to lose your job to somebody that's using AI. That's the guy you're going to lose your job to, right? Because he's using these new tools. So, you know, the question isn't really like, is it useful or, you know, it, it's, is it a threat or anything like that? It, it's just another tool, right? So if you, it's like the evolution, you know, the abacus all the way out to the, you know, the pencil and paper to the calculator to Excel. And now we're in, you know, co-pilot land where you've got AI and all this stuff. Okay, cool. Again, all tools. Right. So, you know, I think that's really, that's it. And if I could just go back to the, the data in, data out thing, I didn't want to lose track of crediting um, a, a new uh, LinkedIn friend that I made. It's a gentleman named uh, Gus Bechtish. Gus has a phenomenal concept, what he calls mad AI disease, which I think is great, right? If you think about mad cow disease, right, it was when people had this crazy idea to like, you know, feed cow parts back to themselves. Like, and it made all the cows insane, right? And what happens when you put AI generated data back out into the algorithm again to give you new data that's supposed to be trustworthy that gets then published. So if you've got like tons of different data that people are using as a result of AI that are being published on say the public internet and you've got a sufficiently large population, which I would argue today we do, right? publishing this AI data and then the AI goes back again and scrapes it, at what point does it become mad AI disease? <laughs> I don't know, but we're probably not too far from it. I guess we'll find out. <laughs> I love that concept. I often talk about the one of the biggest challenges with the using this technology is it's going to create a whole bunch of lazy people um, because you know, the it'll bring up an average uh, the average performer up to a bit higher level because it'll create a bit more consistency. But the good people will get lazier because they don't need to think as much. And this probably leads into my next question around all of this. What we're talking about is all awareness and education. And it's quite clear this is sort of, it's not new technology, but I guess it's more, it's new in terms of um, the mass, the mass use. Um, what, what should we be educating our end clients on? You've mentioned to the C-suite, we need to sort of help them align to the strategic objectives of the business. And you know, there's opportunities there for ongoing advice and workshopping and design work and all this other stuff for our partners. But. For that end user that's actually using this technology, what what should they be knowing to get the best out of this sort of tech? So this is a really nuanced question because every person is going to have their own different level of importance to what's what they want to see out of it, right? And this is this is partially why uh, I started off the conversation at the C suite and the director level, right? Because when you when you when you talk to C-suite, they're going to have a different use case than the head of marketing and then the intern, right? So it really isn't like all end users are the same. And, you know, you want to say, oh, this is like the correct approach, right? 
you know, it, it, if I put my consultant hat on for a sec, right, because I've done, you know, 24 years in IT and, you know, I've had this business for 13 years and I started this AI company last year. Um, you know, it's it really depends on who you talk to, right? Like we have very different conversations with systems integrators than we do with MSPs, uh, than we do with executives, right? The conversation we have with the system integrator is, is very technical. You know, it, it's walking through and showing them Here's the security architecture. Here's how we treat encryption, end-to-end -end encryption, true end-to-end -end encryption, right, with SSL uh, encryption. And, you know, here's how the data is secured at rest in transit. Here's what you can do to bolt technology. It's a very technical conversation, which I love. Love those conversations, right? Um, the conversation with the MSP, and I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not going to speak for every MSP out there, but is often about how to sell it, right? Because what I found is that uh, a not inconsequential number of MSPs are actually not great sellers. Right? Like they're really good engineers, um, but they're not necessarily great salespeople. So, you know, what we try to do is we try to encourage the MSP to look at the, the business value of what, what's happening, what, what's being brought to the table, but, and almost the result. Um, so you have to think at it really through that, like, you know, that five, seven year old lens, right? You know, like the, the, the young kid lens of saying like, well, what does it do? You know, and I, I have four kids under eight years old and I show them my work regularly and they don't care about anything except the stuff they can see and talks to them and they can appreciate. And I'm not saying executives are toddlers. They're not. Right. But they have to be brought the value proposition at that level. Right. You have to be able to go to them and you have to be able to say, look, you put this in, it's going to cost you this. It's going to take this time. And here's what you're going to get out of it. Right. So it kind of goes back to, you know, what is what's the benefit to it? Right. Like, what are you bringing to the table and not necessarily what makes you unique or anything like that? So I would say that the conversation is nuanced, but I would say as a general guideline, one thing that is most helpful, like a kind of a, a door opener and sets the 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 tone of the conversation. You start talking to anybody about AI, ask them, what's the one thing I could do that would be the most valuable for you? Or how could I be helpful for you? What's important to you in the next 30 minutes? Let's see, you have 30 minutes, right? Just start with that question. Hey, I'm here to talk to you about AI. I'm going to do that. But first, I want to understand, right? What, what could I do that would be most helpful for you? How can I help you best? What's on your mind? What, what do you find most valuable? What do you want to get out of the conversation? Right? And by starting off the conversation this way, what you're doing is you're empowering the other person to tell you what's important to them. And even in the first couple of sentences, right, when we communicate with other people, we're, we're sending telemetry to that person about whether or not we care about them. And in sales, that's extremely important, right? So the conversation, again, like this is coming from someone, I have my master's degree in cybersecurity, my bachelor's in IT, right? I did my CISSP. I love the technology, man. I love it. But I've also come to learn that the sales and business relationship is totally independent. So when you open up a conversation like this and you're not coming at it technically, you're not saying, oh, did you see Copilot Pro? Oh my God, let me show you how it compares against chat GPT teams. Like nobody really, I mean, dude, this may be the first time these executives are hearing about these terms. Like if you've got a screen share up with pricing in the first 90 seconds, you're doing something wrong, right? <laughs> like, unless they asked you to do that. So, you know, I, I think that in answer to your question, you know, it, it, that's really like the, the door opener, right? Is, is saying, you know, what could we do to be helpful for you? Like, what's important to you? And listen to them in the first 30 minutes, uh, or at least the first 30 seconds, just to understand them. And then they're going to recognize, hey, this guy or this girl actually wants to help me. He understands me. She understands me, right? They, they want to help me. And then from there, you can use your experience with the tools and the benefits and the business outcomes to try to tailor the conversation uh, to actually help them. Uh, I think that's so critical because I think a lot of, especially the MSP space, everyone's defaulting to this blanket approach. It's a one size fits all um, type of approach because that's what we've traditionally done as an MSP is create that sort of standardization. Um, we create our standardized stack, we deliver that technology, we manage their infrastructure and we can support it really efficiently. This is a different iteration where we're having to elevate ourselves up to that small business technology advisor first. And then this is a pillar that will have different solutions and use cases. And you, you touched on different um, people in, inside the organization, different departments that have will have different use cases. Different industry verticals are going to have much different use cases in general as well. Um, and different regulations. And this is going circling back to sort of our governance um, conversation of being able to understand what our requirements are for privacy, data, data governments, cyber security, 
in this as well. Um, we've touched on data governance, but what are the cybersecurity implications from AI um, technology? And again, I'm probably op opening a very broad topic here, but yeah, there yes, you are. Well. <laughs> sure. All right. So um, where to start with this one? Cybersecurity is a very, it, it's been impacted heavily by AI. Um, and I'm not sure if people realize how heavily it's been impacted. Um, from a defensive perspective, right, from a protection standpoint, um, I think you can pretty clearly see where a lot of the uh, implementations of AI are present. You know, people are talking about, you know, AI pattern recognition and AI-enabled security services and things like that. And this is all over the place. And look, how much of that is true, I'm not really sure. It kind of goes back to your initial question, what is AI? I don't know. I mean, anybody can say it is, again, your follow-on question, regulating the use of AI, right? I mean, the, the, it's just like this this thick rose bush of, you know, questions where you'll never really quite get that beautiful rose out at the, of the answer that you're looking for. Um, but when it comes to the defensive use, I think it's easier to understand because it's in front of you. Um, what's harder to understand is the offensive side. And, and I think that this is really where a lot more education needs to be done. Um, offensive use with AI to me is really alarming. Um, you know, I, I posted up a little while ago on, on LinkedIn, I think back, um, you know, late 2023, and I'll, I'll, I'll date the podcast now, uh, late 2023 about the um, the use of AI to voice simulate a senator's son calling, saying that they needed help. And it, this was really kind of a sad story because what happened was the the son, quote unquote, right, called and said, dad, I'm stuck. I, I, I can't get out of the airport. Listen, this is the, I, I can't believe I found myself in this situation. You know, there, there's a huge police movement behind me. I'm scared. I got to get on the plane. Oh, can you hear me? Hold, hold on. All right. And then this text message comes through. And all of a sudden the dad goes, oh my God, my son's in danger. Right. And he does what any father would do, which is I'm going to protect my son. Right. So he goes on and he, and he starts going back and forth. Oh my God, let me get this money moved over. He's texting back and forth. Oh, where's the cat? And all of a sudden it dawns on him. He's like, wait a second, was my kid supposed to be traveling? Calls him back. Hey, dad, I'm fine. What's going on? This guy was like blown back off his seat. And he actually went into Congress to, to testify and talk about his experience because that's the use of AI that is horrible. Horrible. I would never want any father to go through that situation. But these guys don't care. The threat actors don't care. They don't care if they're using really effective uh, content generation to create phishing emails after finding out who reports to who on LinkedIn. They don't care if they're using your voice to have a synthetic conversation with somebody else. Or, you know, I mean, even even modern day uh, ransom and hostage holdings, it's all over the news, you know? I mean, and criminal gangs learn from each other. That's the other problem too, you know? One gang does something, it's effective, and they learn about it. Guess what happens? Other gangs copy it. People disappear into the woods because they think that their family is going to get in trouble if they don't. And then they'll call the family and say, hey, your son's missing. Did you notice we're not going to give him back until you wire us the money? And the guy doesn't need to leave his seat. Like, how insane is that? You know, so I feel like, you know, the use of cyber, the use of artificial intelligence in cybersecurity offensively is something that just doesn't get enough press, uh, which is partially why I'm talking to you about it today. You know, I have an obligation to educate people on security. You know, I spent 11 years as a university professor at NYIT, taught over a thousand students, I think it was over like 50 different classes at the graduate and undergraduate level, loved every part of it. I'm still in touch with a lot of those guys today. But some of the stories that I see and some of the questions that I'm getting back on the stuff that they're experiencing right now is beyond the pale. It's stuff that like not e no software can fix. And I guess the, the last thing I'll tell you is that when you really look at security and, and AI, or really just security in general, right? This, and I'm not even talking about supply chain Right? Like, use you know, where does your software come from? And, you know, is your LLM open source and poisoned with some type of backdoor Trojan that's going to run while it's analyzing your content? Right. There's a whole separate question. But, you know, just the defense and depth model from a security standpoint, right? It's just so important that everybody's educated on this stuff. You might get a message from somebody that sounds like your CEO and it may not be him. It may be a voice replica. You may get a message from somebody written in the same exact format saying, hey, here's your accounts receivable statement. We've switched bank accounts and we know that you've had this debt outstanding. So you can wire us 90% to this new account and we'll call it even. You know, we're tired of holding the bag on this on this invoice. You know, and it's written with the exact same language that the person wrote because they had access to your email because they, they because you forgot to turn on two-factor. All right, so now they're writing messages exactly like you with your tone of voice, your punctuation, everything. Like I think that that 
there's just so many examples that I can't even cover with you. I, I you know, I, I don't want to take the entire time pulling examples out, but but these are real problems in the industry, you know. And I feel like the more of these types of examples of cybersecurity abuse of AI that people get exposed to, the better prepared they're going to be to defend against it. And people do need a lot of help and education. And I think the key part of this, not just from the scary cybersecurity part where we need to um, create a lot better awareness and drive a lot more education through our clients and end users. It's also this whole conversation has been around the education and awareness and enabling people to adopt this technology. So I, I really, um, I really want to sort of reiterate that point of we need to elevate ourselves above the technology. We're always going to, we're always going to default to that because that's what we're good at, but we need to get much better as an industry to be people first, then process and then let start to leverage the technology to solve those problems so that we sort of create that human centered thinking. Um, I, I'm very curious, and I know we're diving around a lot. I'm a bit more curious to explore some use cases of AI. And again, I'm asking very broad yeah. questions, but from your experience, um, being in this sort of, um, industry and it's, it's, you know, the, the, the formation of this sort of technology, what, where's sort of the best places to start with looking at use cases, um, to start helping businesses or so, what have you seen work? I am so glad you asked this question, James. I've been waiting for the last half an hour for you to ask me this question. <laughs> I knew it was coming. Um, there are dozens of use cases, and some of them are really exciting, and some of them are really boring. I gave you two boring ones before, so I'll give you the more exciting ones next. The boring ones, as a reminder, were dictionary lookup and acronym lookup, right? Not sexy, not interesting, but super useful. So anyway, um, again, going back to you know how are you producing value for the client? It's okay if it's not a sexy use case to you if it's useful for the client. That's just number one, right? So um, now with that in mind, uh, we have had the unique opportunity to deploy our AI code into a variety of different environments. And uh, in good software design practice, we're constantly asking people, what did you think? What else could it do? What did it do well? What did it not do well? What have you thought since the last time we spoke to you last week? Um, and we also work uh, very closely with Microsoft. We work with them every week and, and we talk about new capabilities and things like that. So the use cases are expanding, I guess is the short version. Uh, but specifically to your question, uh, we have some really cool things that we can bring up. Uh, so since a lot of the folks listening to this will probably be in security and compliance, uh, or at least you know the MSP space, the IT space, um, we have the ability to have AI answer compliance questions. So an example of this would be, you know, you have a, a document that has your compliance guide, guideline, your handbook, okay? Um, you can use OpenAI's uh, large language model to interrogate that document and provide an answer. Um, this is useful if you have multiple clients with the same standard that you've applied, or if you have a large enough client where they have a dedicated compliance department and they have their own handbook that you're contributing to and working with the staff on, they can answer on your behalf. So now you're effectively becoming the knowledge master of that particular uh, domain but not being responsible for the overhead of actually answering the questions. And again, the AI is responsible for understanding the intent of that question. Uh, we have used it to automate uh, service departments in the past, um, you know, just answering questions. We've, some MSPs we've worked with do uh, per ticket resolution. We've configured the AI that we have to automatically run certain workflows when questions are asked, right? By checking permission levels and the intent of the question and confirming the execution with the user. That's a ticket that gets resolved by the MSP that's paid for, but actually run by the AI. So labor cost goes through the floor in, in that model, which is great so you can reduce cost. Um, we've seen instances where a business owner actually is a hospitality owner, a restaurant owner, has barbacks coming in and out, making drinks, right? I haven't drank in years, but I can appreciate this one. New barback comes in, someone asks for that, like, you know, the wacko drink number seven. Nobody knows what the recipe is or how to make it. Barback picks up the phone, says, you know, hey, Emily, what's the recipe for this, you know, Wacky drink number seven, <laughs> and there you go, right? So that's a great use case for, right? Um, you know, beyond the basic stuff like, uh, you know, instantly locating uh, information within documents, I think that's very important too, uh, citing references. Um, you know, we've also seen use cases for providing contact information uh, for especially the new hire experience is a big one too. So, you know, let's say, for example, you, you have a company that's um, got a set of managing partners in it, or you have a couple of guys in the business who are senior that everybody really should know their name, but not everybody does. Right. So, you know, if you've got a junior guy in there, let's say he asks the question two or three times to his peers and then all of a sudden he forgets or he loses track and he gets an email and he's like, this guy looks important. Who is he? Right. Or, you know, 
who, who's who's running this effort again this major new effort in the company like who's responsible for this like and, and the guy's like i don't know i've asked this question six times i'm so embarrassed to ask it a seventh you know so it's like the the, the proxy of embarrassing questions is great too because the AI doesn't care AI is just going to answer you so that's an interesting use case too um also for bigger businesses that have been uh involved in a uh, merger and acquisition this is also very important because businesses that come together oftentimes have different processes and the use case here is really straightforward, right? What you're saying is that when you have one department doing things one way, another department doing things another way, when they're put together, what's the new way that they're operating? And one very common uh, condition that we have to cross with uh, new deployments is folks will say, well, I don't have a process for it. Well, great. It's a great opportunity to create the process, right? And if they don't have the process, at least with what we have with, with Emily AI, there's the ability to ask somebody within the company the question to train the AI. So you have this like knowledge loop of sorts where you never lose the opportunity to collect that information, which is really cool, and then be able to ask the AI in the future. So mergers and acquisitions, another great example. Um, it's just a few more. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you with um, one kind of silly one and two other really useful ones. Um, one silly one is to provide website links. I know it sounds stupid, right? But how many times have you asked somebody, oh, where do I go for this again? What's the link for this again? I mean, some of these attorneys we work with, they have like you know hundreds of different court systems that they log into. And the, the URLs are like 130 characters long. They look like GUIDs, you know? And it's like, oh, did you get the latest bookmark for that? It's like, well, of course, you know? <laughs> I mean, yeah, of course you could ask your partner, but that's that. Um, you know, and, and other things too, like just producing historical research. I mean, we, we've had, you know, if you want to learn more about a person, say you have a VIP coming into town, you know, like you're an admin assistant for someone or, you know, you're showing up to like a court case and you want to learn something about a judge or whatever. I don't know. Is this something that's someone important? If you have a profile on this person, you can give it to a junior person, like particularly in a uh, like a, a court case. Let's say you're showing up to a, a courtroom with a judge, and it's a bench trial. There's no there's no jury, right? And the judge has certain preferences. Never wear a red tie in front of this guy. He hates red ties. Always make sure you copy him on communication with the clerk. Don't ever forget to do that. You know, doesn't matter if you come in late, but you have to make sure you make eye contact most of the time. That's what he likes. That's what she likes. Right? Only an experienced lawyer would know that, right? But what's the power of having a junior guy come in and ask? What should I do? What shouldn't I do? Right? So, I mean, and this is probably, there's more here, obviously, you can tell. But the, the most exciting part of my job right now is working with other organizations to figure out how are you using AI? Like, what's most beneficial to you? And it kind of goes back to what I started with, right? It's just listening. You learn so much by listening, which is why I have so much to share with you today. I've done so much listening. <laughs> So anyways, there's more, but I hope these are helpful for you. These are some really interesting use cases we've come across recently. I, I think that concept of knowledge transfer um, is something that a lot of people just don't consider um, with the AI technology. And like you said, in general, a lot of this isn't sexy. Everyone's getting very excited about AI, generative AI and being able to create stuff out of nothing. But from, even from my own experience, well, I don't like saying it, but I'm a bit of an expert in this industry. I can't use generative AI because it actually doesn't know the answers because I'm the expert. It doesn't have my answers. You can't replace that um, 20 years plus experience. AI isn't going to replace all the stuff that you've done. But what it does is, like what you're describing is, it enables better knowledge transfer from those experienced people into a more scalable way of knowledge management and access of knowledge to all this up and coming generation of younger people that actually know how to access information. They're actually really good at finding information. That's what they're taught. That's what, through school, they're taught to collaborate and be able to find information. They weren't taught the same way I was or you know, older generations. Uh, they weren't taught to dictate information. They were taught to they were taught to be able to collaborate, access information, and then how to and then how to think about applying it. So we've got this opportunity here from what you're describing is to sort of fast track that experience generation. It's where we can help enable those people to get that information, so it's not so reliant on a handful of um, really senior people in the business that know absolutely everything and have to micromanage every decision and every every action to be able to get the results where we're all, all of a sudden opening up this scalable world for the small businesses um, which is super critical um, in this world especially in, down in my part of the world where we don't have a lot of people we don't have enough people to fill the jobs that we've got 
um, that require a whole bunch of experience. So all of a sudden we can change our economies and increase the um, productivity of our small business clients and give them a competitive advantage. And that's where, uh, through this conversation, we, we've been describing that technology side where we need to govern and properly, um, properly secure it and do all the stuff that we're, we sort of default to. But we need to be able to do that translation like, like, like you're talking about, um, which I think is very exciting. Um, but the last question I have before we start to wrap up is with all this excitement and you know, people are sort of on those extremes of they're either scared of it or this like they're, they're in that sort of ignorance is bliss stage and AI is going to solve all the world's problems. How, how do we sort of bring this all together as a, a clearer balance of me as an MSP, security minded governance technology to sort of being able to wrangle back um, those clients that are going to want to run off with this technology and and run into a lot of lot of trouble let me answer it this way find the right people to talk to okay <laughs> this is it um like you said in as much as ai is a powerful tool uh it's not going to replace a human i even said that before too right but somebody using ai probably will right replace that human that's not using it so you need, at the end of the day, to still find the right people to speak with. And I think that this is, this is one of the things that I, I'm so excited about with, with uh, Emily AI. What we've done is, with Archon One, it's the MSP that I, I run, um, I started that 13 years ago. I really understand the day-to-day -day struggles of the MSP. I mean, I, I get it. Like, I don't know how many password resets I've had to handle in my life. Like, I could probably calculate it. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, somebody, the message I would have for MSPs, or to your point, is somebody is talking to them about AI. Someone is, right? And it should be you. And in order to keep yourself well-educated and to understand how to position yourself for success with AI with your clients, you need to have a team of people with you. And that's one of the things that I, I love about working with Pax8. And that's also one of the things that I've really enjoyed about working with other MSPs uh, with Emily AI as well, is we have had the opportunity to connect with other MSPs, right? and show them how Emily AI works. And then we empower them to be able to do things with AI for their clients that they couldn't do before and, and give them these use cases. So one of the coolest parts of my job today is meeting other MSPs and saying to them, what, what are you guys trying to do? What have you heard? What do you learned? And by the way, check out what we're doing with other MSPs, right? And we'll give them these really cool use cases like what I just described before. And what ends up happening is, you know, you provide enough leadership questions like I mentioned earlier, you know, like, what do you, what's your vision for AI? What's, you know, what's your AI strategy? Dude, if people don't have an AI strategy at all, you need to bring it to them, right? Because they're going to create one on their own. So as an MSP, you need to have the guidance of what is it even supposed to look like, right? And those are some of my favorite conversations, right? Because I love talking with other MSPs and saying, look, here's what we've learned across the board. Here's some great questions to ask. You know, here's some ways you can make money off of it, right? Like, that's an obvious one. And, you know, Spoiler alert, it's not Copilot at, you know, however many hundreds of dollars a year's time the number of users, right? There's a lot of other ways you can do it, right? And do it securely at that. Um, so, you know, I would say that engaging in, in that level of conversation with, with um, the other MSP's clients is very important, but we're not going to do that, right? That's something we have to educate the other MSP on. So I would say, you know, if you're, if you're running an IT shop and you're looking for how to actually use this... Um, I'm certainly open to the conversation, right? I think that that should probably go without saying. I love talking about this stuff. I would love anybody that's listening right now, please, would love to talk with you guys. I love it, right? Obviously, James has been listening to me for half an hour now. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to finding the right people to uh, bounce those questions off of, I, I, I think that that's really, that's really the, the critical part, right? Because you're not going to have all the answers. Even if you're AI enabled yourself, where are you getting those answers from? It's the same problem, link checking, fact checking, check your references, right? Um, but you know, you talk to somebody like James, James is going to, you know, you know, your stuff, I'm, you know, you know, it, I've been in the field for, you know, 24 years. There's a couple of guys out there that are beyond, you know, trunk slamming, parts swapping, godaddy.com website hosted, you know, experts <laughs> who can actually provide you a real answer. No, if they can't, they can tell you they can't, and they can tell you why, and they'll point you in the right direction, you know? So I, I would say that that's probably the, the best starting point is uh, just communicate with the right people. So yeah, I love that concept. I think more and more everyone especially MSPs that have become need to 
you need to own that and hold that relationship with the clients, become the technology advisors. You can't, you can't be an expert in all these fields, building that partner to partner ecosystem. There's a whole bunch of specialists that don't want to cut your lunch. They want to, they want to sell through you. It's easier for them as technology people to talk to you and then you talk to your clients and it is for them to work directly anyway, that we can be strong there together. So I love that. I love that you're, you're seeing that and doing that as well. And I love this topic. It's huge. I've, we've jumped around a lot. So to wrap up, what, what do you really want people to take away from this conversation and what's the next step that they should go and take after, after finishing listening to us, uh, talking, talking about this topic? I mean, selfishly, anybody that's made it this far through the podcast, I'd like to talk to because clearly you have an interest in AI and that means that we're probably going to have a great conversation together. <laughs> um, I would say that selfishly. Um, non-selfishly, just educationally, I would say, you know, again, find the right people to learn from, you know, learn from that sense of community. Um, you know, for MSPs specifically, I would have the message of uh, don't be afraid of working with other people in this field. Um, I think there's a natural defensive uh, posture that a lot of people take, you know, you're out to eat my lunch. Like you're not going to help me. You know what, dude, the world is not that bad at scale. There are bad people. Don't get me wrong. I mean, that's why we have a cybersecurity offering because there's enough bad people out there that it matters. But if you're listening to this and you're wondering like, you know, how do I engage on the next step with it? I would say reach out to the trusted contacts, right? Um, and tr by trusted contacts, I mean us, other people, we can point you in the right direction to um, I can't tell you any other random sources. People at Microsoft have been great to us, so I can say you probably trust them. Um, but, you know, I would say that figuring that part out is, is really the, the the next step. But, you know, more than that, though, I would say, you know, just try to think through what an AI engagement should look like with your client. Right? If you want to give them a roadmap, right, like try to think through what it means to be successful with this and start with the outcome in mind. Right. I'm a very goal driven individual. So I try to identify like, what am I really doing? What am I working towards? You know, I wake up in the morning, like what's my objective? And you got to think like that for the business owner, right? The business owner has a goal when he gets up in the morning, probably not AI, probably not talking to you about AI. You're probably just a, a 30 minute slot on its outlook calendar that it's got to get through, right? So your objective is really to figure out how to bring the maximum amount of value you can and to work backwards from that. So um, I would say that's, that's definitely the next step. I mean, in closing, I would say that, you know, we're, we're producing and we're running a AI strategy guide. Um, and believe it or not, the first email blast in the series is if you're going to implement AI, don't start by implementing AI. That's the number one step. And I'll just give you guys a, a, a teaser for it. The reason it's not the number one step is because AI is drawing from data, right? So you, you actually have to start with the data at a technical level to figure out what it's going to be doing, right? And then you have to think about what is it doing for the business? So it, it, it's not like a Llama GPT, OpenAI, you know, chat GPT conference. This is not what it's about, right? It's about what are you, what are you really doing? You know, well, where's your information coming from? How are you managing? Where are you, what is it supposed to do for the business? You know, so I, I would say that, you know, making sure that you don't go off searching for a red herring and say, oh, I spent all this time learning about how this algorithm worked. And now suddenly it's useless because, you know, there's a new AI out of France that just beat the pants off open AI. It's like, now my stuff means nothing. It's like, well, it's kind of on you, man. You know, <laughs> like if you spent that much time up front in the wrong direction. So yeah, I, I would say just, you know, in that regard, partner with the right folks, um, think through benefit outcome driven success first for the client. Uh, and then just, you know, work through that and just stay nimble, right? Adapt, listen, change, uh, and just make progress and, you know, celebrate the small wins along the way. I'm a big proponent of that. I love that. And I think... I'd add to that is just start having the conversations. It's as simple as just starting to talk to your clients about this while you're being educated. You only need to stay one or two steps ahead of your clients. You don't need to be super specialist expert before you um, talk about AI. And much like the way that I describe cybersecurity is this is not a one and done thing. This is not our traditional IT support in the infrastructure management that we pick a tool. Now that we're locked into it for the next three to five years and tick, we're done. This is an ongoing engagement. This is advice, this is consulting, this is um, consistent um, design work and don't try and solve all the world's problems to begin with, like what you just, you described throughout the podcast, Michael. Pick a use case, solve that use case. 
then then improve on it. Then find the next one and chip away at it. Don't don't turn this into a much bigger thing than it needs to be, because technology will change, business uses will change. And you can get more consistent recurring revenue and project revenue by taking it in small chunks and you'll be more successful, build more trust and get ahead of the game of everyone else rather than aiming for perfection before you get into the game. Um, so it's been an awesome conversation, Michael. I've loved having this and I, I could talk to you all day about this kind of stuff. I'm very passionate about this as well. So no doubt I'll have you on again in the future. So thanks for joining me. Hey, Jeeves, it's always a pleasure. And uh, thanks for the chance to talk with you. I've, uh, I always love the conversation. It's always great to talk to you too.